Good evening and welcome to PACE IT's webinar. Tonight we will be talking about CompTIA's A Plus Exam 220-802 and we will be covering objectives 4.4 and 4.5. I'm Brian Farrell. I am the instructor and certificate mentor for Pace IT's TNI program. I'm also an instructor for Edmonds Community College and the course is CIS 205, which amazingly enough is the Pace IT TNI program. Certifications, actually that's most of my certifications. And you're probably wondering what objectives 4.4 and 4.5 are. Well, 4.4 is troubleshooting common video and display issues, and 4.5 is troubleshooting wired and wireless networks. There is a fair amount of information to impart this evening, so let's go ahead and get into tonight's webinar. So I'm going to begin by talking about troubleshooting common video and display issues, and that is objective 4.4 of CompTIA's 220-802. Okay, well before I get into the actual troubleshooting end of things, let's talk briefly about CompTIA's six-step troubleshooting methodology. The first step is to identify the problem. After you've identified the problem, then you can establish a theory of probable cause. Once you've established a theory of probable cause, then you need to test the theory to determine if it's the actual cause. If what you think is the problem, or think, if the test reveals that your uh, probable cause is the actual cause, then you need to establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement the plan. After you've done that, you need to verify full system functionality. Don't just check to see if the original problem has been fixed. You need to verify everything because sometimes a fix can introduce a new problem into the system. And finally, you need to document all findings, actions, and outcomes, both of The reason why you want to document the negative is so that you can keep a future technician from making the same missteps that you might have made. Now we're going to roll back to number one, to identifying the problem. You need to remember, the symptoms are not the problem. The symptoms are how the problem is manifesting. One of the main things that you can do to figure out what the actual problem is, is to ask questions. And whenever possible, witness the problem personally. One of the things that I always say is if you can recreate the problem, then you're about halfway there to solve it. It's another thing that you can do. The whole troubleshooting method hinges on how effective your, your ability to identify the actual problem is. So with that, let's move on to uh, some common video and display issues. And the first thing up is VGA mode. Uh, VGA mode is most likely caused when you have an incorrect driver for your graphics adapter. VGA mode is the default safe resolution and it may result when a video card is incorrect. Or it may actually occur when there's been an update to a driver that had been functioning just fine and now it's caused a conflict and it's not operating correctly. Roll that driver back to the one that worked before and you should be, you should be okay. Next problem would be no image on the screen. There's a couple of likely causes here. Uh, the monitor may not be plugged in or it may not be receiving power. Um, or if it's a flat panel uh, monitor, the backlight might have failed or the inverter for the backlight may have failed. If that is the case, 
then the most cost cost effective solving that issue, if it's on a desktop PC, is to go out and buy a new monitor. Uh, you can buy them reasonably inexpensive, and it will more than likely cost you more money to replace an inverter or backlight than it will be to just replace the monitor. How do you tell if it's the inverter or backlight? Well, if you've got everything on and you have no image, you have a black screen, take a flashlight and shine it at the screen. If you can see the image in the flashlight's light, then you know it's the inverter or the backlight. So that's how you that's how you know that. So how about an overheating shutdown? An overheating shutdown issue. Well, the most likely can. Today's graphics cards run hard. You can read that as running hot. So they need really good airflow. Not only that, but they're heating up the inside of the case. So that airflow needs to be very good or else you're going to have an overheat problem. Moving on, dead pixels. Well, the most likely cause is dead pixels. Uh, it is very common for displays, flat panel displays, to have dead pixels right out of the box. Most of the time, we don't even notice them. Uh, and they really don't become a problem until you end up with too many dead pixels. Then it's a problem. Uh, the easiest way to fix a dead pixel is to replace it under warranty. It is possible that the pixels are just stuck, and there are different methods out there that purport to be able to unstick stuck pixels. Uh, you can Google that and look at some YouTube videos. Uh, some people have said that they've had luck doing that. Uh, I've never really had luck doing it. I usually, well, most of the time I just don't have the patience. I will go out and replace the monitor. Then there are artifacts. Artifacts are when your displayed image has got some like funny gaps in it that kind of shift around. Uh, they're not always in the same place. It's they tend to make your image look very pixelated. There are a couple of likely causes here. It could be an overheating graphics card that's about to shut down, by the way. Or you may have a bad connection at the DVI interface, either on the monitor or on the PC. If you want to check to see if it's the interface, the DVI interface, uh, check to make sure that the plugs are nice and tight. Okay. That should help. Um, if it's an overheat problem, check. If you suspect overheat, uh, check the ventilation. If that doesn't resolve the problem, guess what? You've probably got a bad DVI interface, which may be on the monitor or it may be the interface on the PC. Or you may have a bad pen in the cable. Time to start troubleshooting even further. Okay, so now let's talk about color patterns being incorrect. The most likely cause is poor color calibration. As I state here, most people will not notice this problem. Most of us aren't, and or most of us just aren't that peculiar about our color representation. Uh, we see green and it can be recognized as being green. But if you are a graphics artist or a photographer, that may bug you a lot. In which case, you can manually adjust the color settings. It may take you a while because as you adjust the hue and saturation of one of the values, you may find out, find out that it throws off the hue and saturation of another value. So you've got to fiddle with it back and forth, back and forth. Like I said, most of us won't recognize or be bothered by it, but there you go. Uh, dim image. Dim image has a couple of causes that are that can occur. Uh, one of the things that could, can happen is that somebody may be playing a practical joke and that they have turned down the brightness level of the monitor. You can turn it back up. Or 
your inverter or backlight may be about to fail, in which case to replacing the monitor. And if you're using a cathode RAID tube type monitor, a CRT type monitor, and the, the color brightness isn't turn, hasn't been turned down, guess what? It's time to replace that monitor because that electron gun is about to fail. Uh, plus, if you're using a CRT and you're not a high-end graphics artist or photographer, you should probably replace that monitor anyways. It's about time. Flickering image, most likely cause is a low refresh rate. All of our all of our video displays do refresh the image on the screen multiple times. Panel technology like an LCD, LED, plasma, or OLED, it's refreshing that page. It's refreshing the image, the whole screen at a time, which is different than a CRT, which is refreshing the image either a line at a time, going from top to bottom or bottom to top, or it's doing every other line, which is called interlaced. Um, that is more than likely where you may have the flickering image. Turn up the refresh rate, preferably to 72 hertz or cycles uh, per second or higher, and that flickering should go away. Also, if you're kind of related to this, if you get eye strain when viewing a monitor, if you have the capability, turn up the refresh rate. A lot of the times that will reduce the eye strain um, and make the image better. Distorted image, you have the wrong resolution. All modern flat panel displays have a native resolution. <coughs> Excuse me. Displaying your image in something other than the native resolution may cause distortion of your screen. Go back to the native resolution. It's the best one. It's what the monitor was designed for. Discoloration. Um, the most likely cause is magnetic interference. Uh, that's mostly an issue with cathode ray tube monitors. Uh, you can try moving uh, electrical appliances away from the screen. That should help the uh, discoloration go away. Um, true story, back in the day, working customer service somewhere, every time the phone would ring, the screen would go all kinds of funky colors. That's because of the magnets that were being activated in the ring. Uh, all you had really had to do was move that telephone away from the monitor by about six or seven inches, and the discoloration would go away. I'm kind of showing my age there, but hey, that's just the way it is. Um, next problem. Actually, I should say next symptom is the blue screen of death, the BSOD, uh, the most likely cause if you're getting that and it's due to a video or display is an incorrect driver. It's not very common in today's modern operating systems, but it can still occur. So I would suggest booting back up in safe mode and updating your video drivers if that is in fact the, the reason for it. And there we have, we have now covered troubleshooting common video and display issues. So now let's move on to troubleshooting wired and wireless networks. Is no connectivity. Well, the most likely cause is the network interface, your NIC. Check to see if you have link lights um, are on and blinking on both the PC and at the switch or router, depending upon where you're connected to. Uh, check your cables. Make sure that they're connected nice and solid. Uh, and if that is doesn't resolve the problem, what I would do, because it's easier, is I would unplug my network cable from the switch and plug it into a new port on the switch and see if I got connectivity back. 
If no connectivity, then it's time to look at the other end, where more than likely it's inside your case. Is a PIPA, Automatic Private Internet Protocol Addressing Address. So in a PIPA address, the most likely cause is an incorrect dynamic host configuration protocol setting, so an incorrect DHCP setting. How do you tell if you have an APIPA address? Well, you can't, you can only, you can't get out of the local network. Then you open up a command prompt and you type in ipconfig space forward slash all and you look at your IP address and it starts with a 169.254. Start with that 169.254 and that actually denotes a problem with your DHCP. Now it's time to check your property settings for IPv4 on whichever device is your DHCP server. Uh, you can also check on the local machine to see if maybe you have the wrong default gateway, which is usually your DHCP server as well. Limited connectivity, so you can't get out to the internet. Well, the most likely cause is your device or the router. If you can't, if you can't connect to a local device, as in some something within the local network, check the device that you're using. But you can connect to other devices within your local network. You need to go and check the router. It may be down. It may be need to be rebooted, or you may be plugged into the wrong port, or there may be a wrong setting on it. But either way, if you can connect to local devices, you're fine. Time to check the router. Funny that I just talked about local connectivity only, and we're back on it. So the most likely cause is your default gateway. A default gateway is required to reach other networks. Now the setting for your default gateway could be wrong on the device that you're trying to connect out of, or your default gateway settings may be incorrect on the router. You need to check both. Uh, there may be the off chance that your router is blind. Blah. Suppose you're experiencing intermittent connectivity. Well, the most likely cause is one of three things. This could be caused by a bad cable. If they do go bad. Uh, it could be caused by a network interface card or network interface controller that's about ready to go bad. Or you may have a bad port on the switch or router. It's time to try and narrow it down a little bit farther. Uh, you need to test each device to, to see which one it might be each device or item uh, and check to see what it might be. If nobody else is experiencing problems, I would probably look at the cable first. But that's me. How about IP conflicts? Sometimes you boot up and you get you get an IP address, you get the right IP address. Sometimes you boot up and you don't. Well, the most likely configured address it uh, doesn't happen very often if you're using DHCP, but it is like, well, it is. It can happen, or it's more likely to happen if you're using static IP addressing. In, in which case, you happen to have two devices that are, in which case, you have two two devices that are trying to use the same IPv address, IPv4 address, and by the way, only one of those is allowed on the network at a time. And when that happens, the first device to boot up is the one that receives the IPv4 address. The next one on is out of luck and will not receive the IPv4 address and therefore can't get on the internet. So now let's move on. Now we're going to move on to more of the wireless issues. Major causes of wireless issues include uh, the service set identifier or SSID mismatch, by the way, those are case sensitive. So if you have a weird SSID 
access ID or network name. Uh, you need to make sure that everybody understands the proper way that to input it. So everything that's capital is capital. Everything that's lowercase is lowercase, so on and so forth. Then there's the security type mismatch. Uh, mismatch in the security type will prevent a connection. So if you have a device, a wireless access point, and its highest level of security is wired equivalent privacy, or WEP, um, then when you log on with your wireless devices, then you need to use WEP. And by the way, your wireless access point is item, is the device that establishes the security type that is used in your wireless network. And if I go back to that wired equivalent privacy type network, um, what I would really recommend is that you replace that, that wireless access point with something a little bit more modern. They haven't made WEP devices since 2002, or at least wholly WEP type devices since 2002, guess what? Update it. Get something more secure. Uh, the third problem, most common problem on wireless networks is a passphrase, which is also your, called a password, or a security key, uh, mismatch. Again, these are case sensitive. Those are your three most likely causes of wireless networks. So now, let's talk about some symptoms. And we're going to start off with no connectivity, and it's a new device that's trying to log on. Remember those three most likely causes that I just talked about? Well, guess what? They're the most likely cause in this situation. You have a configuration mistake. Check your SSID, check the security type, and check the password. Make sure all three of them are correct. My guess is, more than likely, one of those is wrong. And that's a pretty easy problem to fix. Next problem, no connectivity. And it's an old device. It's a device that was on the network before, and now, for some reason, it cannot log on to the wireless network. There are two likely causes. First one up is the wireless access point, or your device may have a wireless failure. Uh, the way to check that is check to see if other devices that have been on the wireless network are still on the network. If they are, then you know it's with your device that's trying to log on to the network. How about intermittent connectivity to the wireless network? Well, the most likely cause is your wireless access points placement. Where do we place most of our wireless access points? Well, we tend to place them where our internet comes into the into the building. So, and that always occurs out on an edge, now, doesn't it? Well, in most cases, it does. So that's where we put our wireless access points. And now you're trying to get connectivity all the way across the building or upstairs, whatever. So your signal strength is too too low. Your signal strength is too low. You can try um, you can try adjusting your WAP placement, move it to a more central location. Uh, you can in some some wireless access points, you can turn up the radio power. But there is a caveat to that. If you turn up the radio power too far, you maybe end up pushing your signal to where you don't want it to be, like out in your driveway, or if you live in an apartment complex, out into the parking lot, or if you're in a business, out into the parking lot. Uh, you really don't want your wireless signal going that far, seeing up the power. How about low transfer speeds? Well, your most likely cause is signal interference. Um, the most common radio frequency currently on the market is the 2.4 gigahertz radio frequency that's used by uh, 802.11b, G, N, and a, and a lot of the newer uh, access points also 
so dot eleven AC type also operate or can operate on the two point four gigahertz frequency. Most modern cordless phones also operate on that frequency. Also microwave ovens emit at 2.4 gigahertz. So it can be causing interference. You can mitigate that issue by adjusting which channel you're using, adjusting which channel you're using, or you may be able to mitigate it by changing where your wireless access point is or where your antennas are. You can also sometimes overpower that interference by turning up the power settings. But remember what I said about that. So what I'd really recommend is adjusting which channel you're emitting on. And remember, with the 2.4 gigahertz frequency, there are 11 channels that you can use. Uh, so you might want to try adjusting that first see if you can negate the interference that way. Radio frequency signals. Well, your most likely cause is either your wireless access point placement or the power setting. And again, you need to balance your needs between security and usability. Adjust the WAP placement. Personally, whenever possible, I try and put that wireless access point in a central location so that I can get even coverage throughout the building or space in which I'm operating in whenever possible. So now let's move on to some tools. And the first tool that I'm going to recommend or talk about is the loopback plug. It's UNIC of the network interface controller. Most of us know that you can ping. Most of us know that you can ping. 127.0.0.1 uh, and get a response. And a lot of people think that you're actually testing your NIC when you do that, but you're not. What you're really doing is you're testing to see if your IPv4 uh, protocol stack has initialized the NIC. That's where a loopback plug comes in handy. It plugs into the network interface controller. And when you Ping, you can ping your IP address, and what it does is it sends that ping request out of the, the network card and then right back in. So it will actually ping itself. That way you can test whether or not the NIC is actually functioning. Some cable tools that you may want to have on hand, actually I'd recommend that you do have them on hand when you're dealing with wired networks, is a cable tester. 30 of your cable. A lot of testers nowadays can actually tell you which standard you're using, whether that's the EIA, TIA, 568A or 568B standard. Uh, it can tell you if there's a break in the cable. It can tell you a lot of the times if two wires have been crossed. It, some of the newer ones can actually tell you uh, if it's a loopback cable newer ones. They're not all that new, sorry. Um, and you could get a cable certifier, which is a cable tester that will actually check the, the ability of that cable to handle loads, as in how much speed you can send data through that, through that cable. Cable certifiers are a little bit more expensive than a straight up tester. But you know what? If you're dealing with a lot of cables, you might want to have one. Uh, toner probes. Toner probes are kind of handy, handy to have. They're a two-piece tool. They have an injector piece and they have a probe piece. Sometimes these are called the fox and hound. Signal tone into a wire, and then you use the probe to find the wire, like in the wall. As the probe gets close to where the wire is located, it will emit a tone, and this allows you to trace that wire from end to end throughout the building, and you can find out where it's at. This helps you to resolve problems. I hope you guys didn't catch that sneeze, but if you did, I apologize. 
Next tool is the punch down tool. These are used to place network cables into, pen, into punch down blocks. A lot of punch down blocks, of the less expensive ones, come with this little plastic punch down tool. They do work, but they're really kind of a pain. I'd really recommend getting a real punch down tool that has blades for a 66 block and for a 110 block. Nice thing about a punch down tool is not only does it place the wire into the punch down block and secure it, but it also trims it. You're going to need a pair of wire strippers uh, specifically to remove the insulation, the insulating jacket from the outside of net. Put those cable ends into a punch down block or into a modular con connector like an RJ45, in which case you're also going to need a crimper. The crimper is used to secure cables into the proper termination end. Some crimpers are straight up for just RJ45s. Some of them can do RJ45s, RJ11s, and then there are also crimpers that are used for coaxial cable cabling. Wow. Now let's move on to some software type tools. In the first that we'll first one that we have is IP config, that protocol configuration, and it's used to review IP configurations on a Microsoft Windows node. If you happen to have a Mac, so an OS X, a Unix, a Linux, including Android, by the way, that would be IF config, not IP config. Then there's ping, P-I-N-G. It uses ICMP, which is Internet Control Messaging Protocol, echo request packets, and you use it to test for basic connectivity between two nodes, between two endpoints. It goes from end to end. You ping the address that you're positive, then you know you've got a connection, or it's possible to make a connection. If you don't, then you don't. Then you've got to start figuring out where the break in the line of communication occurs, which is where Trace RT comes up for you Mac, for you Mac OS X, Linux, Unix, Android, so on and so forth users. That would be Trace Route, all one word, by the way. And it too uses ICMP echo requests, but it also uses an incrementing time to live field. More on that all later. A webinar, or an earlier webinar, I can't remember at this point in time, um, but it uses ICMP echo time to live field, and it maps the path between two nodes. So if you have a bunch of routers between you and the destination, and you're not getting a connection, you might want to consider running Tracert. It will let you know which routers are not responding, or if in fact you're getting all the way through, but you're just not getting making a connection to the other end. Yeah. Then there's NetStat, which stands for Network Statistics. This is used to identify which applications are using network connections. If you use the NetStat command, you can see every single TCP IP connection that is open and active. And you can look at the statistics and figure out which one of those buggers is creating the problems for you. Then there's NBT stat, which is NetBIOS stat. It's used to try the. Uh, it's used to troubleshoot NetBIOS name resolution issues. NetBIOS was a Microsoft implementation uh, that allowed PCs and other devices to be able to communicate together. It's a little bit legacy, but it's still active. If you've got any kind of Windows operating system on your network. It's most commonly used to establish the path to a network share. And that would be with the net use command. Um, there's another couple of nifty uses for the net command. You might actually want to Google that one. Uh, there's actually a way to bypass the uh, startup logon screen for Windows 7 and earlier operating systems by using the net command. So let's talk about wireless wireless troubleshooting tools. Well, 
all of the software utilities that we just talked about in the wired also work for wireless networks. For hardware tools, a wireless locator. Wireless locators are used mainly to sniff out and find rogue wireless access points. However, they can be also help to troubleshoot wireless networks. And many of them can not only find the networks, but they can evaluate the radio frequency strength. Um, they can also help you find hidden wireless networks, so on and so forth. They can help you to judge where your signal is going, where you're overpowered, and where you're weak. And that concludes this webinar. Uh, video and display issues, and wired and wireless networks. And thank you for watching tonight's webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to send them to me. I will answer them to the best of my ability.